Hello, and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our first of five talks about creativity. We'll be looking at life's capacity to find novel and often beautiful solutions when facing obstacles. We can see life's creativity on view in many different realms of experience. It's obvious when we're in the beauty of wild nature. We can see it in the complexity and ingenuity of living forms that have evolved through time. We can see it in human artistic and technological advances. And we can see it in our own individual lives as we confront challenges, adapt to difficult circumstances, and find ways of remaining engaged with life with a sense of meaning and purpose as we move from one phase of life to the next. As I go through this talk and the four to follow, I will be drawing from my own personal experience. I encourage you to reflect upon your life experience as we continue this discussion about creativity over this session and the ones to follow. Let's begin. The creativity of life is on view in many different realms of experience, as I said. So here's just one of countless examples. This orchid attracts pollinators by mimicking the female of a particular species of tropical bee. The male bees are attracted to this visual stimulus. They attempt to mate with the flower and they are dusted with pollen as they do. Eventually they move on, find another flower of the same species, attempt to mate with that one, and thus transfer the pollen from one flower to the next. So this is a creative way for this plant species to secure pollination in a crowded tropical environment. We could define creativity as life's capacity to solve the difficulties that inevitably confront it. Some sort of obstacle obstructs the path of life, and if there is a way past it, life will generally find it. Human creativity is just an example of this capacity of life. Humans have been devising machines and increasing their capacity to develop visual and musical and literary art for as long as humans have been on this planet. But as stated, this creativity is simply an extension of life's baseline capacity to find novel solutions. Human creativity isn't always about using tools, developing technologies, gaining skill as artists. It can also be about compassion, about having the social ability to comfort, work together, creatively meet the difficulties of life, and so on. And in fact, it seems likely that human success depends more on this kind of social creativity than it does on technological advancements. After all, our technological prowess would never have developed to the degree that it has if we weren't capable of creatively working together. I want to introduce our specific approach to creativity by use of this work of art by Henri Matisse. He began making these cutout pieces late in his life after suffering a medical situation I'll describe later. This is a very large work, this particular cutout, covering a whole wall. One reason I want to start with it is it makes obvious the need for raw materials. For these works of art that Matisse developed, he needed to have pieces of paper that were colored 
that he could cut into various shapes and have his assistants paste on the background. He used paper that was painted with gauche, but any colored paper might have sufficed. And so we can see how there is a progression from the raw materials to the finished artwork. The need for raw material is something that can be overlooked when we think about creativity. Even something that seems rather immaterial, like literature, builds on the prior works of literature, the language itself, and the personal history of the author. Now, our bodies are examples of life's creativity. And they, too, require raw materials. We're looking now at a sculpture of a human body, which, of course, was made out of clay, which is a fairly bland and consistent material. But the interior of a human body is far more complex, and its raw materials depend on the digestive system in large part. So we all know how this works. Several times a day, most of us are ingesting various kinds of food. These travel through the digestive tract. Eventually, some waste product is expelled out the far end of the tract. But the important steps are along the way. We know, of course, that we get energy from the food we eat. And if we reflected on it, we'd also realize that we get the raw materials that our bodies need to repair themselves, replace tissues that have worn out, and so on. For instance, red blood cells only have a lifespan of about four months, and so they need to be replaced regularly. So do skin cells. So do the cells that line the digestive tract itself. There's this need for raw materials. And of course, there was a huge need for raw materials when the body was constructed in the first place. Each of us began life as a single cell after the fusion of eggs and sperm. And the body was built up in the uterus of our mother over the nine months of gestation using the raw materials that came from the foods that she ate. Ever since birth, of course, we've harvested our own raw materials with our own digestive tract. So this is a simplified description of digestion. And we can see how for the body to creatively build and repair itself and to allow us to act in the world in creative ways, there is a direct connection between digestion and the process we call creativity, the capacity. I want to talk a little about one class of raw material that goes into the building of a human body. In the last talk series, I mentioned antibodies, an important component of the immune system. Now, antibodies are proteins. They were discussed in the fourth episode of the integrity series that precedes this one. Now, the protein that is an antibody is made, as all proteins are, by stringing together the raw material known as amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that occur in living systems. Our bodies can make many of these from simpler molecules, but some of them it needs to acquire in whole form from the foods we eat. And even the ones the body can synthesize are built out of raw materials that come from foodstuffs. So here we are schematically representing the amino acids as these little circles that need to be strung together into the strand that becomes a protein chain that is then folded upon itself to become a functional protein such as an antibody. Now there is a process, a very complex and well-studied one, by which the body puts amino acids together into the strings to create proteins. And it's that creativity that underpins much of the activity in our bodies. To see how this creativity works, we can look at the process of protein synthesis. 
One key component of it is the amino acid itself, shown on the right here as a little ball, which is attached in the cell to a carrier molecule, technically referred to as a tRNA. Each amino acid has a specific carrier that attaches to it, and the carrier is capable of reading, as it were, particular spots on the genetic code. This happens on a structure called a ribosome, which is a very large multi-molecular complex that is the site of protein synthesis in every cell in our bodies and indeed in all cells. Toward the bottom there, you can see the strand of the genetic code, in this case, RNA. So the carrier that attaches to the amino acid is also made of RNA, and the two recognize each other, so to speak. And what happens is that the carrier connects to the RNA, and each new amino acid is brought in and connects in this way, and a strand is gradually built up. So what is happening here is amino acids are coming in, they match the code on the RNA molecule that lines them up in the proper sequence, and they are attached to one another. And this leads to what we call a protein. And so we can watch as the amino acids come in on their carriers in the proper sequence dictated by the RNA and are attached to the growing protein chain. So this is a complex process about which a great deal is known. I'm presenting it very simply here, but it makes the point that there is a lot that is creative about the construction of a protein. Getting the amino acids into the right sequence and then having that fold up into the functional protein is something that life worked out long ago and we continue to benefit from that creativity. Of course, there are many types of proteins in the body. There are proteins in the muscle, proteins in the skin, proteins in the digestive tract itself, and proteins basically everywhere. And of course, there are many other biomolecules that are not proteins, such as carbohydrates and fats and nucleic acids like RNA and DNA and so on. All of these are built in processes that look a bit like what we saw in the case of protein. That is, there is a enzymatic process that synthesizes the substances that form our body. Well, there need to be these raw materials in order for that synthesis to occur. In the case of protein synthesis, we need to eat some protein, either plant or animal protein, in order to get the raw material of amino acids, particularly the essential amino acids that the body can't make by itself. And so a protein-rich meal might consist of eggs, and the eggs are broken down in the digestive tract, and that process of digestion releases the raw materials that then can be used for protein synthesis in the way that we saw. So this is a pretty conceptual discussion. For our purposes, it isn't necessary that all of the details be well understood. What is helpful, though, is to have a sense, perhaps, of wonder. This idea that life is pretty amazing, that it can line up the amino acids, that we can figure out how that happens, and that it's happening in our body right now. It can be useful to spend a little time meditating on this profound fact. Just feel into the warm substance of your body, perhaps in your mouth, where there's a warm, wet environment of tongue and saliva. The tongue can move, it can feel the roof of the mouth and the teeth. The tongue has a lining that needs to be replaced because the cells on the surface get worn off as we eat. So in the substance of your tongue, there is protein synthesis happening right now. So there is a portion of the digestive tract that is actively using the raw materials that come from digestion to effect 
an important and necessary repair. So just feeling the quality of living tissue within the mouth. So you could take that initial suggestion of a meditation and sit with it for a longer time. But we will move on and return to Henri Matisse. I mentioned that his adoption of this technique of using cutouts to make art was something that came later in his life, and it was the result of a medical condition. He had a malignancy of his digestive tract and underwent surgery for it. There were complications after the surgery, including a severe infection, that rendered his abdominal wall largely non-functional, so that he had trouble sitting up and was wheelchair bound. He was incapacitated to the point that he could no longer pursue his previous profession as a painter. In due time, he worked out a new way to make art, the cutout technique described briefly earlier. In effect, what happened, we might say, is that the trauma of the surgery and the setback of having a major limitation in capacity afterwards required a kind of digestive process. It's unlikely that Matisse immediately knew what he wanted to do after realizing that he could no longer paint. I imagine it was a bit of a struggle for him. But sooner or later, he was able to digest the change in experience, his new limitations, and solve the problem creatively and produce a new style of art. And in fact, I think it is arguable that this is some of his most notable work, and he himself held that opinion of it, that this work late in life was remarkable in a new way and established a whole new direction for him that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't able to digest this difficult experience and come up with a creative way of moving through it. I am inspired by that story of Matisse because I had a major abdominal operation back in 2012. You can see that the incision required was very large and it led to a dissection by the surgeon all the way back to my spine. A problem with the anesthetic block that was placed to provide post-operative pain control meant that when I woke up from surgery, I had no pain control whatsoever, and so I felt the full impact of this enormous incision and that deep dissection, and it was a kind of pain that was staggering in its intensity. There were other issues following the surgery, including a wound infection. So I was left with a lot to digest. And over time, I was led to teach in the way that I am currently doing. So this idea of mindful biology grew directly out of the illness that led to my need for the surgery and the surgery itself. So the digestive process can happen in this kind of psychological way, leading to a different style of creativity. We're not talking here about protein synthesis, we're talking about synthesizing meaning and purpose in the face of life's obstacles. Now you may or may not have had a major surgery that required some digestion on your part, but I'm sure you've had experiences relating to your body that have indeed required you to take a step back, reassess, find creative solutions, and move forward with a renewed sense of meaning and purpose. The older we get, the more common this kind of experience tends to be, but even young people grapple with changes in their appearance or not having the body shape or size or type that they would prefer, etc. And all of these things require a lot of grappling and a lot of creativity. And that creativity depends upon a kind of digestion of the experience, incorporating a new worldview, a new body image, discovering ways to move forward in life in the face of changed circumstances, and so on. Eventually, we do 
benefit from the power of life's creativity, and we find a way to find meaning in our experience despite whatever changes have occurred. And sometimes the meaning that we find is more powerful for us than where we began. It's not uncommon for some kind of major loss to lead to a change in the way we approach life that ultimately feels like it's more valuable than where we started. I think this dynamic is captured pretty well by the story of the phoenix that rises from the ashes. So each of us at various times have had a kind of ashen experience in our life and have managed to digest that experience and find a creative way to move through and beyond it. And this is another point where we can meditate. We can sit in this body, perhaps with eyes closed, and feel into it, and perhaps remember some bodily challenge that we have faced and surmounted, and how all along the body has done the best that it can given its genetic background and the experiences, traumas, and illnesses that it has endured. And we can feel how we have met these changes in the body, sometimes with early resistance, and often later with a sense of grace and calm acceptance. And that as that has occurred, we've gained in wisdom and seen life from a broader and richer perspective. Now we have been looking at the body in this sculpture, which is a very fine and robust work that does a good job of representing the human form. But we've also seen another version of the human form when we've talked about the digestive tract that runs through the body from mouth to anus. And both of these have a certain kind of accuracy. The sculpture shows what we expect to see when we look at people from the outside. We expect to see a torso and two arms and two legs, a neck and a head. Now there can be many variations on exactly what that all looks like. There will be differences according to age and life experience and biological sex and so on. But the basic form is torso, arms and legs, neck and head. That's our idea of the shape of a human body. But looking at the digestive tract and how it passes right through the middle of the body, we could also use a shape as shown on the right, a kind of human tube. This is accurate in a different sense. It's not what we expect to see, but it is what we experience on a daily basis as we consume food at one end and expel waste at the other, harvesting energy and raw materials along the way. I think it's useful to explore this idea of the human tube we can turn it on its side and lengthen it, exaggerate it, so it's longer than it is in our actual bodies, but so that it resembles an organism that we're familiar with, an earthworm. Now, the earthworm is this long, narrow creature, and we are related to it, as we are to all life. The common ancestor of earthworms and humans lived roughly 500 million years ago. And that ancestor was probably a lot more like a worm than like a human body. Its morphology was probably long and thin with a digestive tract running down the middle of it as shown here, establishing this tubular form. And that tubular form lives within us to this day, all these hundreds of millions of years later. Of course, the digestive tract has elaborated quite a bit. It's got outpouchings and coils, and it fills the interior of our abdomen. 
But in the most basic geometric sense, we remain a tubular being, just like the worm. And so within us is a living, moving, tubular digestive tract. And the body itself is a living tube, as it were, seen from a certain perspective. This tubularity of the body is our final point of meditation for today. We can feel the two ends of the tube. There's an end up by the mouth, where we put food in, and there's an end down by the anal orifice, where we expel fecal material. And we can feel the mouth and the tongue and the teeth and the roof of the mouth as we did before, the moist, saliva-rich interior. And we can feel the anal orifice. We can feel the rectum, where we have a sense of fullness when there's a need for defecation. We can feel that as we sit here. And we can split our attention or alternate so that we're feeling the mouth and the anal region. Both of them, the two ends. And then we can feel how there is this tubular channel that goes all the way from the mouth, all the way down through the body, all the way to the anal region. And just feel, if you would, a kind of energetic openness that extends from mouth to anus. We can get more comprehension of some of the details of this by reviewing some digestive anatomy which we'll do in future talks. But for now, we can just sit, noticing the two ends of the tube and having an intuitive, deep experience of the connection, the long tube that connects the two ends of the digestive tract. So this is life as we feel it and life as we understand it and life as we relate to it. And this is life's creativity in this body, developed through evolutionary time and providing us with the lived experience, with the energy and materials, the substance and the miracle of the body.